Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamanson. Tonight, hundreds of Canadians on a cruise ship prepare for quarantine. It's not what I would, the way I would have wished it to end up. The plan for passengers trapped on board due to a COVID-19 outbreak. And the growing concern for some of the most vulnerable here at home. She's 94, she has Alzheimer's and end-stage congestive heart failure. And as the death toll soars in Italy, 16 million people are locked down. Who's to blame for the crash of MH17? A family's hope for truth as those accused go on trial. That's what we say all the time. Just say sorry. It's gonna be a white male wearing a gray sweater. And they're on the front line of domestic violence in Canada. Every policeman I think over their career probably has the cases that haunt them. We're on shift with first responders. This is The National. Tonight, Ottawa says it has a plan for the hundreds of Canadians stranded on a cruise ship stricken by coronavirus. This is the number of confirmed cases here in Canada continues to rise. There are four provinces with known cases of COVID-19. Three new cases in Ontario bring that province's total to 31. There are four in Quebec. 27 cases in B.C. and now four in Alberta. Three of them linked to a cruise aboard the Grand Princess that ended two weeks ago. That ship has been floating in exile off the coast of California since last week when officials made that connection between former passengers and COVID-19. 237 Canadians are stuck on board. Now, after days of uncertainty, the United States and Canada have revealed what's in store for the thousands of passengers and crew. Aaron Collins gives us the details from Oakland, California. Oakland's port is sleepy today. It won't be tomorrow. That's when the Grand Princess is set to arrive and its 2,500 passengers will begin to disembark. California's governor says it will be the sick that come off the ship first. First tranche of people that will come off the ship in a rapid uh, manner will be those that are uh, symptomatic and those most in need of medical support. 21 people on board have tested positive for COVID-19. U.S. passengers will be sent to military bases in California, Texas and Georgia, where they'll be tested and then held in quarantine for 14 days. As for those 237 Canadians tonight, Global Affairs Canada says their health will be assessed and those with no symptoms will be flown to CFB Trenton in Ontario for a mandatory two-week quarantine. This man from Ontario, glad the government is acting, really disappointed with his final destination. The, uh, it's not what I would, the way I would have wished it to end up. Now, I thought in our case, where nobody sh around me is showing any symptoms, that we would be able to go into a home quarantine, perhaps. This Canadian woman traveling with her husband says when she finally does get off the ship, she won't be getting on another one anytime soon. Absolutely not. Absolutely. I don't think they'll ever catch me on a cruise ship again after this experience. I, just awful. A good way to cut the risk of catching COVID-19. Say no large crowds, no long trips, and above all, don't get on a cruise ship. So while there is a plan for the passengers on the Grand Princess to disembark here in the port of Oakland, it's a different story for the more than 1,000 crew members on board. They will stay where they are, quarantined on the ship, either here in port or back out at sea. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Oakland. Early data suggests elderly people are twice as likely to develop a serious case of COVID-19 and far more likely to die from the disease. As Tina Lovegreen tells us, adding to that concern, news this weekend of an outbreak at a long-term care facility in British Columbia. Undeterred by the coronavirus, they came to Sunday morning service with a plan. You're not going to jostle up against somebody else, so keep your distance as best you can. Avoid mass gatherings and limit interactions. The warnings from health officials have become more urgent, especially for the elderly. We know that the risk for elderly people having this disease um, is very concerning and that they are more likely to have more severe disease. The scenario officials were dreading has become a reality. A long-term care facility in North Vancouver, now the site of an outbreak. With two residents testing positive for the virus, along with a health care worker. It's not clear where the health care worker caught the virus or how many facilities she works for. 
the province's top doctor acknowledging the growing risk. And I just know how stressful it is for our health care system, for my colleagues, and for families that are dealing with this. More than 200 people live here, including Althea Gibb Carsley's mother in law. She's 94, she has Alzheimer's and end stage congestive heart failure. The care centre is effectively on lockdown, focused on containment. They're doing what they can to protect the staff and make the best of it. I think they're doing a pretty good job. But, but families, I think, need to step up a bit. Step up by not going into care homes if they're sick and practicing good hand washing. Standard flu season protocols now at a heightened level. We are discouraging mass gatherings at care homes so that we're not having uh, a large number of people, the public, coming into those places. Many of the usual activities are cancelled, raising another concern for those most at risk, loneliness. And that's going to compound problems with social isolation, which is a huge problem with the elderly. Wash your hands. These churchgoers have faith not in isolation, but in common sense precautions. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, we're joined here in our Vancouver newsroom by Dr. Michael Curry, an emergency room physician in one of the uh, suburban hospitals in Delta. You've been on shift just a couple of days ago. What's it been like in the ER? Well, it's a busy time of year, Ian. We're seeing a lot of respiratory viruses because we are in the peak of regular flu season and the hospital's extremely busy. And you were mentioning to me, of course, Delta close to the U.S. border. That's having an impact on, on the people you're seeing. It is because uh, Washington State has recently declared a COVID-19 breakout area and as a result we have a lot of British Columbians that cross the border for simple tasks like picking up groceries or gasoline and uh, these patients coming back if they do have respiratory symptoms we're obliged to take full measures to protect against COVID-19 and to test them to make sure they're not bringing back the virus. But so far no COVID-19 out of your emergency room as far as you know? Not yet so far. Now, we're hearing all kinds of advice from people, from uh, medical uh, health officers about, um, among other things, avoiding large gatherings. What kind of advice are you giving people? Well, we think the COVID-19 virus is largely spread by what co we call droplet transmission. So it means you can breathe it in if somebody coughs or sneezes directly in your vicinity, but being a heavier than air virus, it's largely sped by droplets that get on your hand. So being in a large environment, there is some risk associated with that, but everything in life does involve some risk. The best thing you can do is try to stay away from people who are sneezing or coughing. If you yourself are sick, make sure you do not go out in public and risk others. And if you are out in public, try to wash your hands as much as possible and avoid touching your face. That advice, obviously good advice we keep on hearing. Now, I know you've been watching this very closely, the spread of COVID-19 over the last few weeks. What are you looking for next? So the big thing is, is whether we're going to see a surge in community transmission in British Columbia. We've had some hints that it may be circulating in the community with at least one, uh, one person testing positive without a travel history or known exposure. And there are hints that it is circulating in other spots of North America in the community. We've yet to see that, but uh, we think that it is unfortunately possible we might be seeing that in the near future. Well, we certainly appreciate checking in with you, Dr. Michael Curry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. What Canada is currently facing pales in comparison to Italy, scene of the largest outbreak in Europe. Cases there have now topped 7,300. And today the country unveiled the most extreme measures to contain the virus seen in the Western world. A wide area of the country's north, including Milan and Venice, are now under quarantine. A region of 16 million people, a quarter of Italy's population, and the source of about a third of the country's GDP. Megan Williams is in Italy tonight. Stiamo affrontando un'emergenza. The dramatic news came in the dead of night. Italian Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte announcing that to contain the soaring coronavirus infections and deaths, the vital economic region of Lombardia and 14 other cities and surrounding areas would go into lockdown, enforced by armed checkpoints, fines and even possible prison time. No one allowed in or out without special permission. News had leaked out before the announcement, and hundreds made a mad dash to catch trains south, hoping to avoid the restrictions by returning to family homes in southern Italy. 
alle loro case. That prompted southern leaders like the president of Puglia to take to social media, where he told those heading south to get off the train, turn your cars around, don't bring the epidemic here. But the vast majority are abiding by the rules and staying in the red zones. Some areas have already been under quarantine for two weeks and with some 1,300 more infected and 133 more deaths in the last 24 hours alone. Lombardia resident Laila Beecher worries the intensive care system is on the brink of collapse. Our hospitals are full. Our intensive care units are getting full. There are really few uh, spots open, so now it's, it's, it's a pretty situation. A prison in the northern town of Modena was the site of rebellion against visiting restrictions due to the virus. Even the Vatican has been affected. With this week, its first patient inside the tiny city-state testing positive. To discourage people from gathering, the Pope live-streamed his Sunday Angelus address instead of delivering it from his balcony overlooking St. Peter's Square praying for all those suffering from the epidemic. Megan Williams, CBC News, Rome. The coronavirus is also adding to economic concerns tonight. COVID-19 has sharply reduced global demand for oil and gas, but that's not the main reason that Canada's oil patch is bracing for a severe drop in the price of crude. That's expected to hit tomorrow morning, and Anita Bath is here to break down what we're watching for. Ian, the prognosis for the oil market is even more dire than the crash we saw in 2014. Saudi Arabia is signaling it will flood the market after OPEC talks to keep production low fell apart. So we are looking at a price war here. This is coming to a head, of course, as the coronavirus is already pushing down demand. There are fewer trucks, planes and ships moving products or passengers. On Friday, oil prices dropped more than 9% to 45.27 a barrel. Experts now forecast a further plunge down to $30 or worse in the coming days. And that's just for Brent crude, the global benchmark. If North American prices do fall as low as some expect, Canada's main benchmark, Western Canada Select, could trade for as little as $5 a barrel. The bottom literally is falling out and uh... Uh, you know, unless something is out there that would stabilize this, it looks like we could continue to see low prices for all commodities uh, because of what I consider to be a real true double whammy on the markets. So we know this is going to have an impact, Anita, on the supply and demand side. Let's start with what this means for consumers. Well, Ian, you may have already noticed there's been a drop in gas prices this weekend across the country. A further drop of eight to nine cents is predicted tomorrow, but gas is only getting cheaper because the global economy is suffering, so it may not really be something to celebrate. Because oil and gas are our number one exports, when you see the devaluation of those commodities uh, and those products, you also have with it a weakness in the Canadian dollar. That has enormous implications for consumers because our purchasing power is really much, very much compromised when we see a devaluation of our most important exports. That means basically the cost of living goes up while we get less for that which we purchase. This will likely be a very hard hit to Canada's resources, especially in provinces like Alberta and Saskatchewan. It's also bad news for manufacturing provinces like Quebec and Ontario. Ian? All right, Anita, thank you. It is already Monday in Australia and Asia, and markets there began to slide as soon as they opened. A direct response to this gloomy outlook for oil. Analysts do say the North American markets probably won't be spared. They open just hours from now. Well, let's turn to other news. The Trudeau government will introduce a bill to ban conversion therapy for minors tomorrow. The controversial practice attempts to change a person's sexual orientation or gender identity. To put it simply, it tries to make them straight often with devastating effects. But as Ashley Burke reports, while some call a ban long overdue, others vow to fight it. Music is what's helping medical student Harper Perrin in the long recovery from conversion therapy. Still struggling half a decade later. Conversion therapy did some significant emotional and sexual harm. Perrin was raised in a Christian evangelical home, taught that being gay is a sin. So at 18, Perrin sought out conversion therapy through a mentor at church. It was like a complete remake of my character. And no matter how hard I tried, 
it wasn't going to change and I still was going to have these crushing kind of like overwhelming feelings um, that I just couldn't cut off and I was causing myself so much pain in the process. Pain that Perrin says led to dark, depressing episodes. Like a lot of suicidal ideation. Um, yeah, it was very unsafe for a number of years. The World Health Organization says therapies to change sexual orientation are a serious threat to people's health and well-being. The Liberal government says it agrees. Evidence demonstrates that this is a practice that does not work. It's destructive, it's harmful, um, and it should not exist. There were calls for the Trudeau government to do this in 2019, but it left it to the provinces, some of which, like Nova Scotia, Manitoba, and Ontario, do block conversion therapy. I find this gross overreach. But religious groups say they will challenge the law over freedom of conscience and religion. The government turns around and says, well, those who want to change their orientation, not through surgery, not through drugs, but just through therapy, those people, they're criminals. But the bill requires opposition support. The NDP are all in. The Conservatives say they support it in principle, but still need to see the language of the bill. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Also tomorrow, the trial begins for the four men accused in the 2014 downing of Malaysian Airlines flight MH17. It was flying from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur when it was shot down over eastern Ukraine. Families of the crash victims today staged this protest outside the Russian embassy in The Hague, setting up empty chairs to represent the 298 victims and calling for Russia to start cooperating with the investigation. Chris Brown has been speaking with families about what they're hoping for from the trial. Candles burn for Bryce Fredericks and his girlfriend Daisy. Upstairs in his old room, his mom Celine has kept things exactly as they were the day five and a half years ago, the pair boarded flight MH17. The bed's not made? No. This came back from Ukraine. This was on the plane? This was on the plane. Though only a few fragments of the couple's remains were ever found, incredibly, this bag was undamaged. Always music in the house, always. I miss that. I, I miss every little thing. The evidence uncovered by investigators points to a Russian missile fired from separatist-held areas of eastern Ukraine is what brought down the jet. Frederick says she hopes the trial will end five and a half years of Russian lies. Russia denies any involvement. I think it's very offensive. Uh, that's the times that Russia is telling lies again and denying things that we know is not true or true. Investigators have painstakingly rebuilt the aircraft and charged four separatist leaders, three Russians and a Ukrainian, with murder and with helping bring a Russian military anti-aircraft missile across the border and firing it at the jet. The family of medical student Andre Angel, the only Canadian on board, says it's too emotional for them to attend. But their lawyer told us a guilty verdict could help with the civil suit against Russia's government. What's at stake there is a declaration that the Russian Federation, the state of Russia, is responsible for the violation of the uh, human rights of all of the passengers. Monday's trial comes just two months after Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752 was similarly shot down by a missile, killing everyone on board. Most passengers were Canadian citizens or had ties to Canada, but within days, unlike Russia, Iran's government admitted fault. That's what we say all the time. Just say sorry. Frederick yeah. says even more than guilty verdicts, an apology is what MH17 families want most of all. Chris Brown, CBC News, in Rotterdam. Harvey Weinstein will be sentenced this week. NDAs are muzzling and silencing women all around the world. Next on The National, why former Fox News anchor Gretchen Carlson is speaking up and her message after Weinstein. Plus on the front lines of domestic violence. Can you tell me exactly what's happened? I showed up here with a name. The impact on first responders. We ride along with the Calgary police to find out. And from tributes. She's really inspirational, but also she she really cares. To protests. What International Women's Day means in 2020. All that ahead on The National. Harvey Weinstein will be sentenced this week and he could get up to 29 years in prison. 
Former Fox News host Gretchen Carlson is one of the many women watching this case very closely. She settled a landmark sexual harassment lawsuit against Fox News back in 2016. And she's on a mission to stop women from being silenced in the workplace. Wendy Mesley sat down with Carlson. Harvey Weinstein's accusers kept quiet for decades. Silence the women, that was part of the strategy. Harvey, you messed with the wrong women. It's not just Hollywood actresses who applauded the verdict. Former Fox and Friends anchor Gretchen Carlson tweeted, I hope the handcuffs are tight. Hashtag Me Too. In 2016, years before Me Too became a movement, Carlson launched a sexual harassment lawsuit against Roger Ailes, her former boss at Fox. Accusing him of sexual harassment. Fox apologized, and Carlson reportedly received $20 million, but part of her settlement includes a non-disclosure agreement, or NDA. Someone has to speak up. Someone has to get mad. That means she can't talk about what happened to her or even talk about how she was portrayed by Nicole Kidman in the movie Bombshell. Thanks for doing this. Of course. I'm looking forward to it. What's it like to watch Nicole Kidman tell your story? <laughs> Is well, it your story? <laughs> well, I can't comment on that, unfortunately. Um, it's a surreal experience to have these amazing actresses playing my character. The point is that NDAs are muzzling and silencing women all around the world from being able to actually tell their own experience. And we need to change that. American employees are routinely bound by NDAs, and not just in cases of sexual harassment. And that's not okay with Gretchen Carlson. The original intent of non-disclosures was so that you did not, if you worked at Burger King, you didn't go over to McDonald's and give the hamburger recipe. Right. Right? And we're not fighting to eradicate that. But it was used against you in a secret arbitration. Yes, yeah, but, the, but so what's happened over the last couple of decades is that companies have become very savvy with regard to using arbitration clauses and NDAs to silence, especially women, but also men, on human rights violations that are occurring within the workplace. That was never the intent of arbitration or NDAs. But then companies got smart and they started settling their harassment claims and discrimination claims in arbitration. And why were they doing that? Why? Because it's secret. When you first started on this, there was, uh, you got a lot of response on social media. Is that what's leading this revolution? You're now tweeting politicians. I mean, is this happening because of social media? My case was a full 15 months before the Harvey Weinstein allegations and the floodgates opened with Me Too. But what made that so successful was that people could go on social media and either put their name and face on their story or remain anonymous. Social media has helped us greatly in getting awareness out there and also um, putting pressure on presidential candidates to have to respond. And that pressure erupted during Michael Bloomberg's failed presidential bid. We are not gonna beat Donald Trump with a man who has who knows how many non-disclosure agreements and the drip, drip, drip of stories of women saying they have been harassed. Listen, if companies want to do the right thing, they will make these changes without being forced to do it. But we can go and introduce bills here on Capitol Hill and we can force them to do it. So, you know, I would encourage companies to get on the right side of history. Thanks so much for talking to me. Sure. Maybe one day it won't take a movie to find out what really happened to Gretchen Carlson. Wendy Mesley, CBC News, New York. Other stories we're watching tonight include an endorsement for a U.S. presidential candidate from a former candidate. I am with great enthusiasm going to endorse Joe Biden for president of the United States. Harris is the latest among the former candidates to back Biden, and it comes just two days before six more states go to the polls. Biden is hoping to build on the success of Super Tuesday, where he won support in 10 states. There were dozens among dozens of people in this lounge. And back here in Canada, a pre-dawn shooting in a crowded Hamilton bar left two dead and sent two others to hospital. Police don't know why they were shot, and they say those who were there haven't been talking. Investigators did get a suspect description, though. Next, we continue our series on stopping domestic violence. Kids are a trigger for me. It makes my heart hurt. I went on the road with Calgary Police to understand how emergency responders cope with the emotional impact. We'll be right back.
Tonight we continue our special series on domestic violence in Canada. CBC News and Radio Canada spent months examining the problem across the country. What we found was an epidemic of abuse and a critical lack of resources for those trying to escape it. We don't have space right now. Far too many abuse victims told us they're simply not getting help. In one month, Canadian shelters turned away almost 19,000 people. You know, when I have to turn a woman down, I, you know, I spend hours thinking, what could I have done differently? And demand only seems to go up. And while there is some progress, especially at the community level, there are growing calls for more consistent federal and provincial support. The services available to women, as well as the levels of protection, shouldn't depend on their postal code. Domestic abuse can have a lasting effect on the people who respond to emergencies as well. In an instant, they can be thrown into emotional and sometimes dangerous situations. And it begins with a call to 911. I went to Calgary to see and hear the impact on first responders. Hello, 911. Can you tell me exactly what's happened? I showed up here with a knife. Walked out and said he had just killed my daughter. Stay with me on the line, okay? 911 emergency. Do you Please fire ambulance. I need to be picked up by the police. I stabbed my girlfriend to death. I killed her. Any call can affect you. It's 7 p.m. I'm heading out with Constables Stacey O'Connor and Oksana Galea. We don't always get domestics just at houses. We get domestics that come in while they're at the grocery store. A domestic at a grocery store? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Both are veteran officers, but this happens to be their first night working together. Within a minute, family camp is destroyed. Within a minute. And just as quickly, a quiet shift can turn urgent. It's going to be a white male wearing a gray sweater. A priority one call, a suicidal male. Did you call us? So where did he go? Nobody knows where he's gone. His partner is distraught, so police search the neighborhood. We did not get a direction of And though they don't know it yet, it is a domestic dispute. When you call 911 in Calgary, it comes here. Can I get a description to see a white fellow? There's no telling what the next call will bring. So our calls come in here. Kate Van Campen has been a dispatcher at Calgary 911 for 10 years. And in that time, calls for domestic disputes have doubled to nearly 20,000, more than 50 a day. Most often, it's men assaulting women. But partners are not the only victims. For me, my very first really difficult call uh, was one that was very difficult to process. It did involve a child. Can you tell me exactly what's happening? It was late in her shift, around 4 a.m., when suddenly everything changed. In a situation with domestic violence, and especially if it's extreme violence, I become very hyper-focused. It's very tunnel vision. What do I have to do to get the help and to um, save lives? So while we're on the line Imagine together, hearing an assault in progress, trying to buy time until the police arrive. I'm going through the critical questions, but I'm also trying to de-escalate the situation. And I'm using every tactic I know. I'm asking about violence, about weapons, how many people are in the house, are there mental health concerns we should know about. I'm also running all of the background checks for my attending units to ensure their safety. And as suddenly as it began, the call was over. Help is on the way, okay? I didn't have to do the, could I have done anything better? Could I have changed anything? I certainly needed some quiet time to reflect on things. And I think about uh, the child involved often still, and it's been many years, and I think of that child all the time. That child survived. Dave Jones is coming up to his ninth year with the Calgary Police Service. He's worked as a patrol officer and in the domestic conflict unit, the unit that follows up on initial calls. People see me in a uniform. They see this. They don't see the human underneath it. A lot of people don't know that uh, that I have a family at home, that I have a greater appreciation now now being a dad, that kids are kids are a trigger for me. Kids are a hot button. What is that like in terms of seeing domestic violence Absolutely. cases with kids? It's hard to go to those calls when you have a nine-year-old calling and screaming in an absolute hysterics because mom or dad's new boyfriend, girlfriend is doing something um, to hurt them or they're a witness to something. It's just, it's it makes my heart hurt. So how do you describe what's on this wall? 
Gord Robertson recently retired from the Calgary Police Service. In 27 years, he has seen a lot. It's the memories. Right. I had a really unique opportunity to bodyguard Dolly Parton. I know, that's... He, young in my career. Yeah. That picture's taken after about a 45-minute high-speed chase with a really prolific car thief. This one here is, was given to me when I left the domestic conflict unit. That's crazy. Murders, undercover drug operations. I asked him about what stays with him. And again, it's a case with a child. Every policeman, I think, over their career probably has the cases that haunt them. And for me, one of those is a domestic violence case that ended in the uh, estranged father killing the young child and then himself. And that kind of sticks with you. It stands out. It sticks with you. And there's different parts of that. Um, so it was me who went and told the mother what had occurred. I gave her the death notification. She uh, requested that I attend the funeral because I'd been part of the family, in her words. And... Uh, it's, it's an experience and an image that, that haunts you. Have you taken advantage of the counseling or mental health yeah. services, but particularly with domestic violence cases? Over the years, the calls that do bug me if I've let them bottled up for a little while, um, I have taken advantage of our psychological services to, and just to talk with somebody who is not a cop, to, who understands the profession, but they're not a police officer. What do you think an older, retired officer might be thinking if he or she heard you saying that? People work in different ways. I am, I, I found something that works for me, ensuring that someone else's bad day isn't my bad day. You're a new age officer. <laughs> <laughs> when you started seeing that change happening at the Calgary Police Service, you know, EAP programs, uh, counseling, you know, you can reach out, mental health is, is part of regular health. Did you envy that? Did you kind of look at that and go, geez, I wish it was like that 25 years ago? Definitely in some regards, but the obstacle that has to be overcome in relation to that is the peer pressure and the stigma. Um, you know, depending on where you're working, there's a certain expectation amongst your peers that you are that big tough cop. It's getting better, it still exists. Back on the street, Galea and O'Connor are searching for a man who said he has nothing to live for. We're being careful not to identify anyone on this call. He's left his home, his family is frantic, and the officers follow a hunch that he'll seek shelter somewhere warm close by. That's him. They go inside to help. Hello. What is happening? We're here to talk, okay? They're in the coffee shop for about 20 minutes, and he explains what's happened in his life and his relationship that's made him so distraught. The officers come back to the car, and for several minutes, they're quiet. What can you tell us about what happened? What happened? Well, we have two people, a couple. They've been married for some time. However, um, someone decided to leave the relationship. This is a different kind of domestic. The threat of violence was to himself, but you get a sense, a little sense of how all of this can weigh you down. How does that leave you feeling? Well, I guess this is the nature of our job. We still have some feelings because we're all human beings. We understand people have emotions, people have children, people love each other. Now, what can, what can we do to help them? We do appreciate that candor and the access the Calgary Police Service and 911 Centre gave us. Tomorrow, the National will take a look at how several U.S. states are aggressively combating domestic violence, making it a specific crime. Tomorrow, Katie Nicholson takes a look at how that works in Minnesota. Here's a preview. Each other in the area. So, Michael, how many calls? domestic calls do you usually get in a shift? Probably say about four to five a shift, and probably one to two are probably an arrestable domestic assault. This is St. Paul, Minnesota, the birthplace of the blueprint for safety. Ready? Do you need medical attention at all? Uh, is that all her blood or just yours? 
Here, if police have enough evidence of an assault, they can arrest a domestic violence suspect, even if the victim isn't cooperative. We have enough to take him to jail, even without her statement, if she doesn't do anything. An innovative program so effective that since it started 10 years ago, there's only been one homicide involving a case on its radar. Watch for that tomorrow on The National. And remember, here in Canada, you're not alone. If you need help and you're in immediate danger, call 911. To find assistance in your area, visit sheltersafe.ca or call endingviolencecanada.org. When we come back, pushing for tougher domestic violence laws abroad. So it's awful. It's a catastrophe for everybody. The obstacles faced in Russia and challenges for survivors. That's next. Russian President Vladimir Putin marked International Women's Day today. In his annual address, he congratulated women on their successes in work and education. And he also called on Russian men to work hard to earn women's respect and affection. But human rights advocates say there is much work to be done on that front. They describe a nationwide scourge of domestic abuse that is getting worse. Chris Brown spoke to one Russian woman who experienced a living nightmare. After all that Margarita Gracheva has endured, it's incredible she can smile or laugh at all. Margarita has written a book about how she ended up like this. Its distressing title is Happy Without Hands. She calls what happened to her tragic, but really, it's barbaric. On December 11, 2017, in a jealous rage, her ex-husband chopped off both of her hands. Перевернулся и стал, ну, реально садистом и маньяком. Поэтому я хочу показать этим, что домашнее насилие это не значит, что это неблагополучная семья или кто-то там пьет, гуляет. Нет. She and her husband Dmitri had been married for five years and had two little boys. Their life was happy at first, but he became increasingly suspicious she was having an affair. This is him testifying in court. В начале октября. Ну начало все. Margarita eventually told him his irrational behavior was unacceptable. She wanted a divorce. He was furious. But that December morning, she had to ask him for a ride to get the kids to daycare. She couldn't have imagined the sick plan he'd come up with. He had previously scouted out a wooded area and purchased an axe. He tied her up and attacked her, delivering 40 blows, first slicing up her leg and then severing and pulverizing both of her hands, leaving them in the snow. One hand was too damaged to be saved. The other took three operations to reattach. Dimitri was sentenced to 14 years in jail, but he could be out as soon as six. Human Rights Watch claims there's abuse in one in four Russian families. Advocates are trying to pass a new law to protect women, but they're facing incredible resistance in this deeply conservative country. До трагедии я обращалась один раз за месяц, когда бывший муж меня вывез с лес с ножом, и сотрудники полиции ничего не сделали, они просто потом закрыли дело. Lawyer Elena Popova is one of Russia's best-known women's advocates. There is no any legal definition what is domestic violence. There is no any restraining order, so you can't have the restraining order if you are the victim of domestic violence. Popova has tried repeatedly to get Russia's parliament to pass a tougher law. But instead, legislators have done the opposite. Just weeks before the 2017 attack on Margarita, 
Russia decriminalized spousal assault. So it's awful. It's a catastrophe for everybody who is involved in this special topic of domestic violence. They call it traditional values, like it's not a violence. It's our traditional value. It's our authority inside our family. It means that I, if I beat my kids, it's just my authority as a parent. Conservative church groups have been the biggest obstacle to tougher domestic violence legislation. We visited Moscow's Church of the Savior Cathedral one night, where some opponents were speaking out in the fiercest possible way. Many at the event equated punishing spousal assault with other negative Western ideas. Ultra-conservative leader Andrei Kurmukin compared it to gay rights or same-sex marriage, saying they're anti-Russian. Like a mindset out of another century, Natalia Rotova told us when a man hits a woman, the woman likely deserves it. It's tempting to think only a few crazies really could think this way. Всем добрый вечер, я Андрей Малахов, и мы в прямом эфире. Жертвы чудовищного преступления Маргарита Грачева и Серпухова... Except that when Margarita Gracheva went on this mainstream Russian TV show, some of the questions she faced demonstrates how victim-blaming is pretty standard here. А ты прокручивала в голове тот день и... Was there something you could have done that would have prevented this tragedy, asked the host. A defense lawyer pressed her, maybe there was something behind this. Maybe you did have some kind of a relationship with another man. Gracheva told us such comments infuriate her, but she stays focused on what matters now. Such as figuring out her new German-made hand. Для меня было огромным счастьем, когда я там смогла заново себе варить кофе, переворачивать страницы в книжке. Ты какие-то мелочи в обычной жизни не замечаешь. Still only 27, she says she dreams of being in a happy relationship again. A friend who is a professional photographer did this glamorous photo shoot to help her build her confidence. Личная жизнь, я говорю, я не ставлю на личной жизни кресты. Я, ну, понимаю, что по одному мужчине нельзя судить весь мужской пол. Это не значит, что теперь все такие будут. Я в будущем планирую создать семью, хочу родить дочку. Her resilience is remarkable, but her fear persists that when her husband gets out of jail and tries to get back into her life. Russia still won't have laws in place to protect her. Chris Brown, CBC News in St. Petersburg. Next on the national messages of solidarity on International Women's Day. Women, children, our allies, our brothers are out there supporting, wanting to make a positive future. We take you around the world in tonight's moment. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, we follow a domestic violence case from police call to prosecution in St. Paul, Minnesota, to see what Canada can learn from this radical program. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Around the world today, people took to the streets in honor of International Women's Day, from India to Spain to right here in Canada. Their messages may differ, but their cause is the same. So tonight, we wanted to give those messages the last word. What this day means to women around the world is our moment. Street! 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 
today on International Women's Day, we still have uh, work to do to reach equity. We want to pre uh, create a safe environment in which women can live safely. <laughs> supporting, wanting to make a positive future, a just society, a sustainable society for equality. We still have a lot of work to do and I want to do that work for myself and also for the next generation. We really are trying to do the things that she does and actions and help make the world a little bit more eco-friendly. Messages of hope and boy after Chris Brown's piece from Russia we sure needed uh, that perspective and a perfect way to end not just uh, this day but really the weekend that is the national for March the 8th. Good night.